my name is, uh, as it says on the slide, Bjarke Pedersen. Uh, I, uh, I have a company called Participation Design Agency, and that is a very fancy word for uh, taking all the tools that I've learned by doing LARPs for 20 years and applying it to basically everything else. Um, and let's see if we can get this to. There we go. And that's the company. So we do all sorts of stuff uh, from uh, big LARPs to uh, a game uh, about karma for the Roskiller Festival for 10,000 participants to board games to a master class in experience design. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. And uh, it's a little bit weird because I've been giving a lot of talks about what LARP is to experienced designers, and now I'm doing the experience design talk to you guys. And it's sort of the same thing, but it needs to, there's some little bit of calibration that we need to do. Um, and I'm going to talk, it's going to take maybe an hour and 20 minutes, and then we have hopefully a lot of time for questions. Let's see. Um, and then I will, of course, talk about uh, what an, an experience is, what design is, and how I think about design. And I'll give you some practical tools that you can use uh, with your own projects, if it's a party or if it's a LARP. It, basically, the toolkit works with everything that's an experience where people are participating. So, uh, experience design or is, a, <clears throat> is a way of thinking. It's, 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 a, it's both a toolkit that you can apply directly, but it's also a way of looking at the experiences that you do. And first, of course, we need to define what is an experience. And, um, that is really hard, and there's many opinions on that. <clears throat> this, this sort of the thing where I see this, that there's a start, then you go to this place, then there's some sort of transformation, uh, and then there's an end. And then the people will leave the thing that you're doing. Of course, that's not entirely true, but we'll get to that in a little bit while. Um, how many went to Johanna's talk yesterday? Great. I have some of her slides in here, because <laughs> they're really good. <clears throat> um, but I, I, I will be focus, focusing on some different things that she did, so let's see if it's, if it's not going to get boring. This is one of her slides. So, an experience exists in time. So, an experience often have a defined time that it is happening in, uh, then it exist in space. Often it's a physical space, like this room is also an experience. It could also be something that moves around, but it is enclosed within a certain group. I think yesterday you did the bachelorette party or bachelor party. When you meet a bachelor party and people are being like stupid and weird, you first get annoyed and then you say, oh, it's just a bachelor party. They're allowed to be shit-faced drunk and do stupid stuff. But they're moving around in the city. So it's still enclosed in uh, space, but can be moving around. And experience have a narrative structure. Because when we moved through time and space, the way the human brain works is that we create stories from what we are experiencing, and then we look at that afterwards. So you need to uh, focus on that you have to design that narrative or help people design that narrative or they will do it themselves and then you're not in control of their experience. Um, studies have shown that <clears throat> what people remember after an experience is the last 20% of time you are at the experience and then there are some like nodal points that you remember, one, two, maybe three. So if you know this then you can Make sure that the ending is brilliant, what is happening in the middle is good, and then there's a few points where you make sure everything is brilliant as well, and that is what people recreate their story from. This has been uh, research, for example, in pain research, where uh, they realize that when you're doing a colonoscopy, for example, if the, um, 
that it's it, in, in some cases or most cases it's better that it's longer so you are you are get, you are actually receiving totally more pain because it's longer but you will only remember if you do it correctly you will remember only those high points so even though you have totally have more pain you will remember it as less so we construct these narratives after we have done it also during but after is where we will understand the total complexity of the thing. And experience also have a social dynamic, like in this room there's a social dynamic, we know each other, some of, some of the people in here know each other, some don't, but there's been a friendly atmosphere all weekend, so we behave maybe a little bit more relaxed than normally. Also, since this is a friendly space, I'm also more relaxed than I'm normally when I do uh, talks, because this is family, right? So things will change depending on the social uh, uh, dynamic that's in the room. So when does the, this is the answer to a question, which is when do the experience start? And it starts when people hear about your event. It doesn't start when they come here, just like Knudepunkt started for you when, you when the dates were announced. Okay, can I come? Can my friends come? What will I do? Should I do a program item? Uh, what laughs have I played? And so on and so forth. It all, the narrative already starts when you realize there is an event going on. So for example, when you're doing your lab, as soon as you announce the lab, that's when you need to start controlling uh, the narrative that you want the thing to be. Of course, you don't control it 100%, but at least you can make an effort of controlling it while it's going on. <clears throat> A question. When does your experience end? Anybody has a suggestion? Yes. The story, the narrative will be told and retold and retold. It will transform into something that it might not have been, but it is still going on and you still have a responsibility to uh, react to those stories told from your events to make sure that it is the right stories that are told. Does that make sense? We're really good at making laughs. We've been doing laughs for a long, long time. Or as a community, even though that you maybe just made your first lab or you're thinking about making the first, your first lab, there's so much knowledge in this community and people are super glad to help. There's nothing better for a lab designer to be asked if they, you, would you look over my design? And I think 99.9 .9 would say, yes, of course. Because then you can sort of, you give input and then our, our things become better. So the combined knowledge within our community, it will make sure that new designers become better way faster than when, uh, <clears throat> when people started out in the late 70s, early 80s. And even in some, uh, and that's my community in Denmark, but of course there's other communities where it started back in the 20s, so it's, uh, yeah. A thing we're really shit at is making experiences. Because we focus so much on the lab design that we sort of forget that we are living human beings. Uh, often organizers are super overworked when the experience starts and they, are, they don't have uh, the energy to talk to their players in the right way. Uh, to make sure everything goes as planned, or even have a plan of everything else except the lab, the runtime. But the things that happen before and after, you often forget. Or I, I have also often forget. But th and this is what this talk is actually about: is is that we need to be better at making the experience as a whole, to be able to make sure that our events in general become better, and then our labs become better. Because if our participants are stressed or feel unsafe, then they cannot participate at the level that you would love them to.
And when you do experience design, what you are doing is asking questions. Questions, questions, questions. And this goes both for LARP and for all other stuff. And it's, <clears throat> it's sort of a, um, whenever I go to anything, I cannot stop my brain from asking all those questions that I do when I make LARPs uh, uh, as a hobby or when I do stuff professionally. And some of the questions that I ask when I go, for example, let's say to a museum, is uh, what happens the first five meters or the first 15 seconds? So, for example, when we walk into the lobby here, it's quite easy to see that you need to go to the reception because you see it directly. But I've been to many museums, for example, where you walk in and you, you have no idea where, can I bring my bag or not? Uh, should I pay or not? Who should I talk to? And so on. And when you're in that state, you, you feel unsafe, uh, anxious, and then you're not really listening uh, or seeing. Um, and of course, it's, do you know where to go? Are your affordances clear? Again, and affordances is this, what, what, what options do you have to act? I'll talk a little bit more about affordances later. Do you feel safe? Uh, and when you leave, did you get what you wanted? Was it a good experience? Did you see the art you wanted to see? Uh, and so on. And what emotional impact uh, has this experience had on you? And one of my uh, favorite horrible examples is a, a water culture house in Copenhagen. It's a very beautiful place, um, very beautifully designed, but it's only the aesthetics, the, the visual aesthetics that has been important for the thing. So when you get in there, it's complete disaster experience wise. So this is uh, the locker room where you undress and you shower before you go to the swimming pools. As you can see, it's a very beautifully, uh, beautiful lockers. You will probably sit down on the bench and then you remove your clothes. Uh, then you'll go over to one of the lockers, you'll put your clothes in and then you realize there are no keys because there's like a little display where you have to enter your, no, the number of your locker, put in your own pin, push some buttons, and then the, the locker locks. The problem is that the instructions to that display is, on, is outside the locker room. <laughs> so you just remove all of your clothes, and then you need to go out in the hallway to look at the instructions. That's, you know, that's not, it's not, that is not a good design experience, right? <laughs> the next thing is that when you go into the, to the showers next door with your towel, there are no hooks to put your towel on because that would look ugly in the very beautifully designed shower area. So you have to put them on the floor, which is wet. And again, you know, these people have definitely not asked the questions or even thought about what would the experience be going into this place, what will happen next, what will happen next, what would happen next. They have just sat at a computer and designed something very beautiful and not thought about the human beings that needs to use this place. And that's uh, quite important is that we are human beings with human uh, needs and you need to cover those human needs to be able to make a great experience. And um, yeah, it should be obvious, but it, it, it is rarely obvious. So when you design experiences or anything, also a, a culture house, you really need to ask all those questions. And you need to use design as a tool to give that experience ex the exact way that you want it to give it. Um, when you design experiences, you also have to realize that it's a super powerful tool. You can use it for good, you can use it for bad. Uh, people are, are using this to manipulate you every day. Um, and if you understand how this works, you will be able to navigate through that world better. Uh, and design shapes uh, everything from your behaviors to the opinions you have to the, which groups that you are uh, in and how society works in general. I talk a lot when I 
do experience design about designable surfaces. And um, a designable surface is anything that you, with the design tools, can uh, alter or uh, move around or make do in a specific way that you want it to do, so you will get the result that you are hoping for. The big problem and the daunting task of any designer of experiences is that everything is a designable surface. You can literally design everything. Of course, it's, sometimes you don't have the budget for that, or the time for that, or the skills for that, but you need to understand that anything within the thing you do can be designed and the outcome of that design will affect how your experience works. Also, all the stuff that you don't design. Does that make sense? Cool. And design of surface is not only physical space, it's also social space. And you need to design for both to be able to control what your experience will be. Um, Johanna has, um, we have talked a lot about what is the opposite of design uh, and one of the things we come up with which works pretty well, it's not the whole truth, is that the opposite of design is tradition. It's quite important to, to know that tradition is not the opposite of design, but if you do not design, if you just do what you've been doing always, you are not designing, then you're just doing. And that, of course, also opens up that all that experience that you have uh, already, uh, you need to question all, all aspects of all things with your experience every time you do it. And it can be that the answer to your question is doing exactly the same as you've been doing all along, but you, you really need to think about if that is the case. So taking a design from one lab, for example, and just straight applying it into a different lab with a different theme and a different length, uh, a different play culture if you do it in a different, in different location, that is not designing. That is just doing, and you will not get the same outcome. Or if you do, then you're lucky. And you are, of course, allowed to be lucky, but uh, I'm quite a pessimist when it comes to design uh, that <coughs> You rarely get lucky, but you, if you work hard, you will, you will get the results that you are hoping for. What design does when you do design is that it focuses your participant's mind. It draws attention to itself and it makes people do different behaviors that they would do normally. This, of course, sounds an awful lot like manipulation, and it is. Um, design, design of experiences is manipulating your participants to do what you want them to do, not necessarily what they want to do. If you have done your communication right, they, of course, will be calibrated towards what you want to do, and they, hopefully, by saying yes and paying to go to your event, uh, they want the same thing as you. And this, uh, this is, we as human beings are super bad at most things. This sounds weird, but, but we, the way that the human mind works is that it wants to do as little work as possible um, all the time. That's why you keep doing stuff. I think all of us, I don't know, I at least have done many times, I, I go out the door and then I go towards work and then you realize that it's Saturday and you're actually going to a friend, but you were just in your mind and then you just, your, the foot just took, took you there where it thinks that you want to go, right? We've all experienced this, I think. A couple of examples on the manipulation thing and how this works, our since our brain won't, don't want to do these things, we can, if we know how, we can push buttons uh, on your uh, in your participant's mind and make them do what you want. A great example from uh, the restaurant industry is, of course, if you, if you serve food on a plate, 
that is a st strong contrast to the food, people will eat 20% less, but they will feel equally full. So I'll say that one more time. So because of the contrast of the plate, which is visual input, you will eat 20% less food, but feel equally full to if you have eaten it off a white plate. And another thing is that coffee tastes better from a white mug, <laughs> even though it's the same coffee. And that is weird, right? <laughs> but that's the way it is. And this goes for all senses. Um, this is Las Vegas. Since the early 90s in Vegas, they have put specific scents into the air condition to make people gamble more. Uh, it started at the Bellagio Hotel in 91, and now it's basically in all casinos all over the world. The scents are different from, say, the casino in Monte Carlo and the casinos in Vegas because scents are associated with different things on the two continents. So of you, need to, uh, you need to know your audience. Another thing that, of course, also is important when you gamble, because the, the scents make you gamble more. Another thing, of course, if you're rested, you gamble more. So they did the tests on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. On a Sunday, when they did the test putting scents into the air condition, um, how much more do you think people gambled? Any suggestions? Is it 10%? 15? 15? 15? Forty-five percent more. So uh, my point here is, of course, is that if you know the tools, you can make sure your participants get a great experience. A, a thing you can do directly next time you have an event, if you're running late, give people something warm to drink when they arrive. Because when people drink a warm drink, their patience is almost twice as big as if they are drinking something cold. <coughs> so if you know you're running late, give them a cup of tea, and then they will not complain. They'll complain way less and way later than if you gave them something cold to drink. And this, of course, can be utilized in lab design, in the experience before and after, and also during. Um, so when you design experiences and labs, uh, you of course need to understand where can you apply these tools uh, and when and how. Um, and there's, there's something that we do when we do labs is that when you take people from one state of mind into another state of mind, the rules change and all of the rules change. Um, and we do this very unconsciously when we step into a room. We follow the social codes that people are doing in the room. So if you can, if you can design and move people's behaviors, then everybody will follow suit. Uh, and it, this is often described as a magic circle. This is from uh, sociology. Uh, and it is that the rules inside the circle are different than the rules outside the circle. So when you're in a ritual space, different things apply, there's a transformation, then you step out of that ritual room. And it, we, this has been talked a lot about in, in lab theory as well, that what we do is that we create a magic circle where the rules are different. We have all agreed that when we are inside the lab, I'm an elf, and when the lab is not on, I'm not an elf. Uh, a very easy example is, is of course the boxing match. People, when they are inside the boxing ring, it is expected for the two boxers to hit each other in the face as hard as they can. And if they did it in the parking lot, they would get arrested, right? Theater is the same thing. These are not... When they're on, the st on stage and the play is going on, the actors are not actors, but they are, they are their, the characters that they're portraying from the play. And of course, a wedding is also a magic circle and what happens inside the magic circle, it can only happen then and there. That's the space and time and social 
uh, agreements I talked about earlier, the, the couple could do the exact same ritual at a bar the night before. It would not be the, a wedding, it would be a rehearsal, but when they do it in the space that we have agreed is different, the church, then it becomes real. Does that make sense? Cool. But that is only one part of the puzzle when we do labs. And these are sort of some of the major things that we need to design for when we do LARPs. Um, first, of course, we have rules. Rules are stuff that is not happening within the fictional world, within the diegesis. Rules are when is it, uh, how much does it cost, uh, safety rules. You're not allowed to use a real sword in our buffer LARP because people will die, and so on. That are, that's rules. Then we have Mechanics. Mechanics are stuff that will step over the boundary between the, the LARP and the world outside. It is stuff that uh, we have decided are ways of negotiating the, the world that we are in. For example, uh, game mechanic, um, it is a replacement, uh, but a buffer sword is not a real sword. We've agreed within the fiction that this is a sword and there are specific ways of behaving connected to when you get hit by the sword, right? So that is also something that we often design, and I, I think we, uh, a lot of people are doing that very well. Then we need to design what affordances our participants have. An affordance, um, if you, for example, in a computer game, there's a door, but because it looks like a door, and say there's a door. But I think many of us who, who play computer games <laughs> We go and check if the, the computer door has the affordance of a door. Can you open it? Can you lock it? Uh, does the handle work? Uh, and many times the door does not have the affordance of door in a computer game. Uh, and it, it's the same thing with lab. We have a physical space we do the lab in. If you go outside that, then the lab stops. So the, your affordances also change. So we need also to understand and often and ask the question, what affordances will our players have during the thing? Not only inside the lab, but also the time before and after. What are the affordances that I can give to my participants so I will get the lab that I want? Alibi uh, is also um, something quite important. Um, it's something I explored quite a bit in, in my LARPs. Um, an alibi is, it's not really a great term, because at least in the American sense, an alibi is, is something you have so you have, so you can prove that you have not done something. The way that we use it is that an alibi is the reason you can do something. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what Alibi does is it takes you from your comfort zone, out of your comfort zone, and over to where the magic happened. It builds a bridge. From there, you feel safe it, and gives you the tools to be able to step into something you have not tried before. Uh, a mask is a great example of alibi. I think all of us, when we have gone to a, like a costume party, we behave a little bit different than if it's not a costume party, right? Because the costume that you're wearing or the mask you're wearing gives you some alibi to behave differently. And there's been done some research into this, which is uh, quite uh, exciting, which is um, if you take people and put them in a doctor's coat, they will <laughs> unconsciously change their behavior to become more authoritative uh, and they will, uh, they, will take, they, they will take control of a room and make decisions. And if you put them in a priest's outfit, they will become more compassionate. Because with the outfits, is the, with the outfits certain uh, behaviors and emotions are connected to these outfits. Of course, it's different culturally where you're from, so you need to understand uh, what the, those different things are. I put on a, a, a jacket today to seem more serious than the hoodie I had on earlier because then you would listen more. I have a, a good friend who, uh, who is a physicist and works at CERN, and when he sits with the other uh, PhDs and doctors and they are trying to figure something out, and he wants his opinion through, he says, 
um, I think, I think I, I, we need to summarize. I'll just go to the whiteboard and mark down all the things that we have talked about. And then he writes it on the board. And then he says, I think this is the best option. And then he sits down. What he's doing there is manipulating the other uh, doctors of physics to do what he says. Because they have gone to school all their life and they know that the person by the board is the person that has the right answer. So he gets his way, but he's manipulating them. And, all, and he, he tells people afterwards that he, what he has done. I'm not sure if it's a good thing to do, but at least, you know, yeah. When I, I have worked in the event business for many years and done like traditional like Christmas parties and, and so on. Um, and you want people to dance at your party. But I think we all have, have, have thrown a party and there's music and maybe you have some lights and we have balloons and we make it really nice. But nobody's dancing, even though all of the affordances of dancing, which is music, dance floor, maybe some lights, uh, that is both that space gives you the affordance of dancing. It also gives you the alibi to dance, but apparently that's not enough. Because as I said, we've all been to parties where nobody's dancing, even though people want to dance, but they don't want to be out on the floor. So what I've been doing when I do professional parties, I hire somebody to be dancing. Because then you're not the first person on the floor. But what I realized was that I should never hire people like this guy to be dancing. Because then it's intimidating and you're not going to go out on the floor if he's on the floor. You want this guy on the floor, right? <laughs> so I, I know there will be a lot of dancing if I throw a party where my dear friend Sonia is at. I think Sonia's in the room. <laughs> hey, Sonia. I'm sorry to out you, but it's for a good cause. <laughs> so Sonia dances like an aerobic instructor in the early 80s. <laughs> <laughs> and it's glorious, and it's fun, and you cannot not dance when Sonia is dancing. And that is alibi. You are not the first on the floor. Somebody is doing the craziest, greatest moves in the history of dance. And you think, I can do that. I can be stupid on, look stupid on the dance floor. So that is a way to create an experience where you get the outcome that you want. And this is probably one of the, the things that is really hard, is understanding. If, if the, your participants do not understand all the things that you're trying to tell them, all the other stuff, then of course they can't do it. So communication is super important. It's super important to know who, who's your audience and how do you convey the thing you want them to do so they understand it. Not only that you understand it, but other people understand it. And I think a big problem that our community has, or at least our subculture has, is the threshold to participate is super high. You need to understand the language, you need to know some people and so on. And we can be way better at communicating what this is about so people will feel safe and they understand what this is. I think I have so many times tried to explain what lab is to people who have not labbed, and it's absolutely impossible. But then they go there and then they have an absolutely mind-blowing experience because lab is a very, very powerful tool. Uh, and that is a big problem. We have not solved a way of explaining lab to people who have not tried it. Uh, and I think that's something that I would love help with. Uh, and I, th I would love if you could think about this and we could discuss it maybe later or online. Uh, but that is, that is one of our, I think one of our biggest problems is that we have no, we have very, we're very bad at explaining what it, this is uh, to outsiders. <coughs> and I tried many, many times at many conferences all, uh, in the States and in Europe and so on, and it is super hard to do. So I would love some help with that. Feeling safe, again, and this goes for everything, if you do not feel safe, you cannot be brave. 
And you need to be brave to, to pretend some, to be somebody that you are not. You need to trust the people around you will not, when you try to portray to be your character, will not say, hey, Bjarke, you stop doing that thing, right? Or you need to trust people that they will accept your character status, for example, because a king or a queen will not be a king or a queen without the other participants will be pushing that uh, character status to a position where they can be the king or the queen. So we need to work very hard that people feel safe. Surprises are never good in LARPs. Ever. <laughs> because then people are unsafe, and when they're unsafe, they will not role play. They will not LARP. Uh, they will just be scared. And that's the lead that you don't want scared people. And when you take all of the things when you design your LARP, uh, all of these things can give your participants agency. <coughs> so agency is what you as a participant know and feel are the things uh, and that you are allowed to do what you want to do and you could do it in a safe way. You know all the rules that are in the room, both socially, what game mechanics they're running, what the, the, and, and everything around that will make sure that you have uh, agency. So agency, the short version is that what am I able to do in this situation and what am I allowed to do? And this is what we're designing for, to give people agency so they can act. Does that make sense? Cool. Earlier in the talk, I, I, I said that what I do when I design is ask questions. Where will it be? How, what will the budget be? It's all questions, questions, questions. What mechanics are the best thing for this lab to give me the outcome that I want? Uh, and the most single most important question that I ask uh, when I have an idea to a lab and also ask any lab that I will go to is um, what will you actually be doing? I have asked this question to many designers uh, or organizers of labs and then they say, well, it's set in the 30s and you're gonna, you're gonna wear some cool clothes. Yeah, yeah, but what will I be doing at the thing? It's, it's a gangster game. Uh, no, no. What will I be doing? What are the actions that, is, that we will focus on in this LARP? If you cannot answer that question, you need to go back and work harder. <coughs> and Johanna said another thing which is in conjunction with this, which is what are the verbs of your LARP or experience? What are the verbs people will be doing? So we're having a party, one of the ver verbs will be dancing. It could probably be socializing. Uh, and you need to define what are those verbs, because when you know those verbs, you will also know where to take all of the rest of your design. This will be what some, one of the core things when you do your thing is, what are those verbs? And that can be many, many verbs, and they can be different in different places of your experience or LARP, but you need to think long and hard about this. Um, when I make LARPs, um, I often people ask me, what story are you trying to tell? And then I say, I'm not really trying to tell stories, but I'm trying to build an experience where people <laughs> have specific verbs they do. Uh, and I, I call it that I, my type, the type of design I do, I call it an interaction machine. I, uh, there's a lot of stuff, many LARP traditions have where they, they talk a lot about what, are, what is the narrative and the story and all that. 
Uh, and I, I focus very little on that, but I focus on what are the interactions that I make available to my participants and how can I make sure that no matter what is put into that design, there will be interaction. Because I believe that when we LARP, uh, when we have those magic moments that LARP can create, that is when there's a lot of interaction going on between the participants. So as long as the interactions adhere to the theme that you have set for your LARP, what the actions, uh, the interactions actually are, is not super important. So I say I built an interaction machine and when the, the players and the mechanics and the rules uh, and the theme are all cogs in this, cogs in this big machine, uh, and whatever you throw in there, it will create something. And I'm, I of course, I'm also interested in what you put into that machine, but basically it doesn't really matter that if the participants know that if, the, if these type of things happen, I need to react in this way or in this way, then they are interacting and that is what creates the lab magic. I know it's super fuzzy and vague and I, I think I need to write an article about this so I also can get this straight in my mind, but that's the way I look at it, is that what are all the cogs in, in the machine <coughs> and what would be the best ones for this specific LARP. Um, and an example of that is uh, end of the line, the, the vampire game uh, Johanna Peterson and I did, uh, uh, produced by Jose Hancom and uh, Mikko Pavle. Um, and what we did was that we took the idea, we said, okay, we're gonna do a vampire game. White Wolf wants us to do something that is very low powered, okay. We say, okay, what is vampire actually about? And I started out doing vampire campaigns back in the 90s in Copenhagen. I done a lot of vampire games and we sat down and said, okay, what is vampire actually? And on the cover of the book, at least the first couple of editions, it says a game about personal horror. Okay, we need to do a LARP about personal horror then. What else is on the cover of the book? It says vampire. And as Johanna said, when we were looking, said we probably need some vampires in a vampire game. <laughs> it's on the title, okay, great. And then it says the masquerade, okay. Maybe we should also focus on the masquerade and on personal horror. And that is sort of the core of the LARP. Then the next question we then ask is, okay, what makes a vampire a vampire? And that is, of course, drinking blood. There needs to be drinking blood in a vampire game. I have made many, many vampire games where nobody, no, none of the vampires in the vampire game drank blood. Which is pretty weird since that's the defining thing about vampires is that they drink blood. Okay, we need blood drinking. How do we have, how do we make sure that the blood drinking at the LARP? Not all participants uh, can play a vampire then, because we need humans to be able to have blood drinking. Okay, then it's a game about humans, because we're probably gonna need a lot of humans for that to happen to, both for the, those people playing the vampires, uh, will have the vampire experience of drinking blood, but also the vampire experience of being drunk from is also a valid vampire experience. So as you can see, sort of, it starts out with like a very basic premise and then everything sort of solves itself. Okay, now it's a vampire game about humans. Yes? It's just, you didn't explain what the masquerade is. I don't remember. Okay, sorry. The masquerade is a concept in, in, in Vampire the Masquerade where vampires need to keep hidden uh, because if they don't, humans will realize they're vampires and they will, of course, kill all the vampires and since there's way many more humans that will happen so they live in this like they, they hide in secrets and they make sure that they don't, do not show their vampiric tendencies yeah um, so this was sort of to demonstrate that sort of chain of thought design uh, experienced thinking is that this very simple things basically solves all other questions about what is in this LARP and of course, uh, end of the line is a very short LARP. It, it takes an evening uh, and it's about one thing. And for example, the other big, uh, the other uh, White Wolf LARP uh, that Sobak Studios did, uh, Convention of Thorns, is a massive LARP with hundreds of people over several days. 
And then it's, it's probably, as uh, they have explained in that, that their design is that they did not want one single experience, which was what we were aiming for. They wanted people to be able to go to a lab and have the experience that they wanted. So there's like maybe 10 or 15 different uh, experiences designed into the big lab. So people can find what, are they going to be like drinking blood and, uh, and being decadent old vampires? Or are they going to do a political game? Or are they going to have a story about their own downfall? All of these are possible in the Convention of Thorns. So you can have many hubs of these verbs uh, within a LARP. <coughs> a little bit more pictures. Um, if you don't design, people will. If you do not make conscious choices about what you want, people will default to what they know. So if you want to, to do a specific thing, you need to tell people that that is what you want. And you need to do it both in your communication, in the rules, in the mechanics, in the themes, in the verbs, everything. You need to make sure that you are doing the design. Because we have different playing styles in different communities, uh, and it can be super hard uh, to go to a different country, for example, with what you think is uh, the way that you LARP, and then you realize people are doing it vastly different. At the end of the line in Helsinki, we knew that all of the players will be people who come to Knudepunkt, and most of those people, when we got the sign-ups, we could see were people from the Nordic countries, especially Finland, of course, since we were in Finland. Uh, and then we knew how to design for them, and the, uh, the game mechanics and the safety systems are calibrated very precisely towards that, because um, when you have uh, your player base and you know that a big part of that player base has the same culture, the outliers within that group will follow suit and they will act the way that people around them are doing. So, and th this is uh, the brilliant uh, thing called herd competence, is that if enough people within your group are doing it, the rest will also do that. Does that make sense? Cool. And this, is, uh, this helps a lot with your design if you know what the herd competence is in your group. When we took End of the Line to New Orleans and ran it for uh, American Vampire Lovers at the Grand Masquerade, uh, which is like a fan convention for, for World of Darkness games, uh, we knew that next to nobody would be from the Nordic community. So we need to completely redesign the, uh, the interaction mechanics and the safety rules to make sure that our participants would have a safe experience. And the only way we could do that, because we knew very little about this culture, was that we make sure to ask a lot of questions to the community. It was like, what do you actually mean when you say character? What do you actually mean when you say in-game? Because we can use the same words, but we can mean vastly different things. Uh, in 2008, I did an uh, art project with Brody Condon, uh, where we did a LARP in a... Uh, in a sculpture park during a festival with mainly Dutch lovers and a few German ones. Uh, Carsten was there. Um, the first, we did it five times. The first run was an absolute disaster. The game collapsed and people went home after one day. It was a shit game. It was really, really bad. Then we, because when we talked to the, the lovers from, from Netherlands, and we asked them questions, and then they answered back in their own lingo, which had the same words that we were using, so we thought we heard what they said, but we absolutely did not. So we had to go back and interview those people who had played that game and ask them all the questions again, and then go down into every little detail. Then we adjusted maybe 10% of the design, and the next game was way better. It did not collapse, and people did not go home uh, early on. Uh, so. We have to uh, be sure that we're actually speaking the same language. Never assume that you, are, that you understand each other. 
this, um, this is a, probably the tool that I use the most when I design, especially when I design with other people. Um, there are three modes of design. And you can ask three questions to all, all <coughs> when you are designing to those three modes. The, the, the first one is why. Why are we doing this? <coughs> and you can ask that to everything. Why, why, why? And that is, of course, about the core concept, the theme, and so on. The next one is what, what will we do? What are we doing? Um, and that uh, concerns way more about uh, what are the actions that will happen inside the thing. The third one is how. How are we going to do it? We need to enter space, we need to do a web page, and so on. So it's way more practical. So, the, the how is the hands and feet. That's what you need, what, that's the actions you need to do to make sure things happening. The what, the what is the brain, you need to figure out how will it play out, why do you need, how do you do all those things. And the why is the heart, that, that is the core of your design. And when you're in a design process at any given time, you, uh, you can always move up a level. So you're talking about, okay, we need, we need a forest, it needs to be this big, and so on. And then we say, okay, but what will the participants be doing? Oh, we, okay, we want them to sail on a boat. Okay, then probably we should also have some water, right? But why do we want that sailing boat? We want the experience of this, this, and this. So you can always move the the dialogue you're having with your fellow organizers up to the why, and always ask the question why, 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 why? Because that will also eliminate a lot of work. And if you do not have the why locked down, it is, you have all possibilities below. So the why in end of the line, that was, uh, we want to do a game about personal horror where people have a vampire experience, uh, that includes the masquerade. That's one. That's what. That okay. One. Why, why did you want to do that? Yeah. True. Putting you on the spot. Thank you. <laughs> to explore that. To explore that, yeah. Explore is that, yeah, true. Thank you. Um, inside Hamlet, which we uh, did a couple of years ago and are doing again this October, the tickets open March 1st. That was a beautiful little plug. Um, there were three acts. The three acts had each their own theme, decadence, deception, and death. And those three teams, uh, themes uh, decided so much of the design because at any given point we could point back to those three things. And those three things can also be converted to the verbs. So first act is about being decadent. The next one is to be deceptive. And the third one is to die. And that is basically what that lab is about. And it, there's a very strong focus on those three verbs through the thing. And all the design uh, reflects that. And that, gives, that makes the process of designing the thing super easy. You say, okay, we want, <coughs> we want a, a decadent first act. Okay, what do we need for that to happen? And that solves a lot of how does the set design look? What is the music that is played? Uh, how are the characters written so we can make sure that the ha they have, within the character, there's an alibi for the participant to do decadent acts, and so on and so on. So that solves basically the answers to all questions. The important thing is, of course, you need to know what, what questions to ask, and that comes with ex experience. But you can always ask other designers, and they will have their opinion, and then you can choose if you want to to follow that or not. <coughs> so when we design experiences, as I say, I think we are pretty shit at making experiences, but the lab is pretty good. And we have sort of the, the core of the lab in the middle, that is your thing your lab, and then there's the experience around it, which is, of course, something that you need to convey, but you need to listen really hard to your participant, what is actually their experience 
how did they take it, did they like it or not, and so on. And only from that you can sort of understand what it is you're doing. And of course, over time, uh, this will create the culture because the design will uh, change the behaviors of your participants and that will turn into culture. An example from vampire gaming, because we, I did a lot of vampire gaming uh, early on uh, when I started designing and then I, f I stopped doing vampire gaming because I found that the culture uh, was very toxic in my community. There was a lot of drama and so on. I was like, I don't want to do thing for vampire gamers anymore because they're dicks. That was sort of my... Of course, I, I didn't realize at the time that I was also one of these people who are conveying this culture. Uh, and sort of my... The way I think about it is that vampire campaign labs are normally, traditionally, about two things. One is intrigue, and the second thing is drama. And if you do that for a long time, that will attract people who enjoy intrigue and drama in the labs. And some of those people also enjoy intrigue and drama outside the labs. And when you're continuously playing, then you'll have people, you'll accumulate people who like drama outside the labs, and then it will become a culture where intrigue and drama is normalized, and that turns toxic very fast. This is not true for all vampire communities, of course. I can only talk about the experience of my own. And when I talk to people who have stopped playing vampire, this is often one of the things that they say is the reason that they think the community around it can be very toxic. So the question is, of course, is there something inherently in the way vampire campaigning is done that creates this culture? I think yes, I might be wrong. And then the next question, how do we make, if we want to do vampire campaign games, how do we make the thing so that will change people's behavior so it will create a culture that is inclusive and, uh, and, and, and healthy? Um, this is a timeline. So um, it starts over on the left. You release information about your experience, people start getting expectations, and then they uh, go to the experience, they still have some expectations, and you build those expectations, for example, during a workshop, then you, you, you build people's expectations of what the experience will be, then you go through the thing, then uh, inside, the, often we have like a, maybe a de-rolling or an after party, there's a lot of reflections, uh, and then it goes into memory, and that memory turns into culture, and then we start all over again. What can I expect from a lab? Now we have some experience, and then you can go through this many times. A very important thing is, uh, in the expectation phase before the experience, uh, earlier I have worked a lot with hype. I was trying to hype my thing so I could get a lot of sign-ups early, so I knew my players would come, but the problem with hype is expectations that you probably cannot meet. Um, and disappointment is solely dependent on people's expectations. I'll say that again. Um, <coughs> disappointment is solely uh, connected to expectations. So if you, if you tell people if you give people too high expectations, they will always be disappointed. So you need to be very clear about what your experience actually will be and not what you will hype it to be. <coughs> it will not benefit you and it will not benefit the participants. And it, it, it's, yeah, just make sure that you, you make sure that people have the right expectations. And I would rather have people not signing up to my life because they, they know what the thing will be, and they will say, this is not for me. Instead of going to a lab, everybody else is going, because they're going to have a shit experience, they're not going to be doing anything for the LARP, and people will have a lesser experience because of this. So make sure that your expectations actually match the experience that you're designing. In the reflection phase after the thing, this is where the story of the LARP or the experience is decided. Because everybody has been an audience of one. You alone experience your story in a lab. And then afterwards, we decide what is the collective story, 
what has this lab been about, was it good or bad, and so on. Um, and here it is very important to listen, uh, and at least in my opinion, you should be very careful about how you manipulate or design that part of the game or the LARP. Because you have, if you, if you have a very intense LARP where people have slept very little and had profound experiences, you can, you can very easily build a cult if you want to. It's very easy to take where people are, uh, if they haven't slept and have great, great emotional experiences, to make sure that they think this is the best thing they have ever done because profound experiences uh, is a great thing and I think many people go to LARP to have profound experiences. But the question you as a designer need to ask is how much of that, uh, how much am I responsible for uh, <coughs> people's experience? Because LARP is inherently co-creative and maybe it's the players who have been really great uh, interacting with each other and that is what has created the game. Uh, back in 2004, I did a game in uh, a lab in a Soviet submarine. Uh, three days, uh, 55 people. Uh, we ran it three times. When the third run was over, I was standing outside. Martin Eriksson comes out of the submarine, runs to me and jumps me and says, Bjarke, this is the best experience of my life. Right behind him comes my great friend Jesper Brun, and he looks me in the eye and says, I hate you, Bjarke, this is shit. And then he walks past. There's two stories that I could tell about that LARP. It, maybe it's in between, but the, it, the interesting part, if not if it was a good game or not, that's also interesting. The interesting part is what, what part of those two people's experience can I claim responsibility for? So I have been to LARPs where I had a shitty time and other people have had the greatest time of their life. Is that because of the design of the LARP or because of the random interactions with the other participants who are co-creating this thing together with us? I think the latter often, and I think we should be super careful about taking responsibility or, or saying it's my, I am the person who made sure everybody had a great time. I think you should look at all, the, all your participants' uh, experience, and if a high number of those people have had the experience that you were expecting them to have and had the interactions that you designed for, then you can start looking at if this is the way that you want to do and if you want to do it again. But you have to be super careful about, about make, if you, you really need to be careful about taking that responsibility and saying, okay, I know this works now, because, because probably you don't. So it's very good to be humble and say that people's great experiences are there, uh, they are, that is the, their thing and all the things that went wrong that is something you need to work with. Does that make sense? There's a lot of great questions to ask, and, and this is, these are some of them. Um, so, what reality are you creating? So what is this, what, what is the world that you're creating for your experience? What kind of society is it? How does all that work? Uh, what are its rules? Again, a great question. I'm going to put the slides online so you can get them afterwards. What will you want your participants to take with them afterwards? And what do you want them to tell their friends about this? This is also something you need to design for. And what do you want them to do afterwards? What kind of roles would people be playing? This is not characters, but what are the roles within the thing? Characters are the person you portray. Roles are function that characters have. So right now I'm the character Bjarke performing the role of, of lecturer. What kind of activities will they be doing? That's again, what will you actually be doing? Uh, and how will you prepare them for the experience? and how are you guiding their expectations? And then there's some bonus questions, which are really good also to ask. I, because I am, have a lot of privilege, I often forget some of these things. 
So these are questions that you need to ask um, when you do things. Especially the two last ones are really important. So <clears throat> who will be excluded for reasons beyond your control? When we did end of the line in Helsinki in an old squat, an actual squat, there was uh, no way of having uh, anybody with a walking disability in the building because it was five floors and there was only shitty stairs with no light. Um, we did not convey this when we opened the sign up, which is a big problem. Um, and you need to then look at the other, what would you need to change for, <clears throat> for the excluded to be welcome? Um, is it something about them or is it something about the world? And this is about, so do you, is it, for us it was, for us and for White Wolf, it was super important that the physical space was as close to the actual space <coughs> in the world. So it's about an illegal techno club in a squad, then we needed an actual squad. And that, of course, eliminates, uh, or that, that excludes a lot of people uh, but it was important for that specific thing that we did that because we wanted it. And what we didn't do, and that's the big mistake, is that we did not write or inform people that these are the reasons we have made these decisions. It could also be about if you only want people who identify as women to play female characters. Again, you of course can do that, but you need to explain why that is the case in this specific instance. And an important thing as designers uh, of experiences is that you really need to take responsibility for your design and make those decisions. This is one of Johanna's slides from yesterday. Designing experiences is designing behaviors and designing behaviors is designing cultures and designing cultures is designing what kinds of worlds we live in. So, this is where the lab sort of turns political, that whatever we are doing, we will shape people's behaviors and that will shape the culture that we want and that will shape what world we live in. So when you do labs, be super uh, focused on what world it is you actually want to do and that will go all the way back to the whys and the themes that you ask. So this is make sure that the world that we want to be in is reflected all the way back to the core of the design. Thank you.